thelandofisrael.com and Israel National TV present Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Live from the heart of Israel, it's Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Shalom and welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Tonight, we have the honor and the privilege of hearing someone a lot smarter than me and Ari for once. Not for once, but most of the time. Put together and exponented. Yeah, very good. She is a spectacular hero. Ari? Now is when I feel like a teenage girl that's about to pass out at a Beatles concert. (laughs) Because I got to tell you, I read our next guest columns religiously. She's the deputy managing editor at the Jerusalem Post. She's the chief diplomatic correspondent at Macquarie Shone. She's the senior fellow for Middle East Affairs at the Washington DC Bay Center for Security Policy. But really, most importantly for me is that she is a very brave lone voice in a world, or at least a country, that is so biased and so far to the left that it's just so refreshing to hear. And she is the ability to to weave this holistic, incredible picture of what's happening in Israel and around the world so we can really understand it. So I'm very grateful that she came to the show and I'm very excited to speak with her. And thank you for coming, Caroline Glick. You know, before we start the interview, I'm gonna say a quick story. Ari's probably gonna kill me for this, but he really is a huge fan. If columnists had groupies, he would would be one. I have a shrine. A couple of years ago, you guys were both invited to speak at a certain conference, and he came back a little bit cheapest, a little bit embarrassed, and he said, I think I came on a little strong with Carolyn. I didn't know what to do. She didn't really respond. She sort of looked at me inquisitively. I came up to her and I said, thank you for existing. (laughs) And I wanted to say, and when I say this, I really say this on behalf of the entire audience here, thank you for existing. Thank you. Well, thank you for existing. (laughs) Thank you for existing. Also, before we get to the actual subject, I'm very excited. My dad has made some very crazy claims in his life. He invented certain punctuation marks. He told me <laughs> that, he, that we were born in the same hospital in Houston, Texas, Methodist Hospital. There you Neither go. of us are Methodists, but we were born in the hospital nonetheless. It's a good Jewish hospital. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and don't mess with Texas. That's very exciting. But it says on your Wikipedia page, Chicago. Well, it was wrong. I didn't write it. You didn't write it. Okay, so... Let's start to to get exactly to what we're here to talk about. You know, the... uh, When I think about the theme of your articles, really it has to do with our leaders today not having the the character and the dignity and the strength that they once had. You know, just when you think about this past week, uh, uh, Vigdor Lieberman had to call in all the ambassadors to remind them that they work for Israel. And thank God he did that. Uh, Thank God he did that, right? (laughs) And they don't work for their host countries. and we had uh, the uh, head of the Israeli army uh, meeting and saying that he advised that we should accept Hamas's ransom for something like a thousand terrorists for Gilad Shalit, when really his job would be to engineer uh, a rescue operation and not advise us to... What happened... <laughs> what happened between the brave and courageous days of the raid on Antebi and today? Um. Well, I I think that one of the things that we see here is that there is a very big disconnect, and I see it over and over and over again, between our leaders and between the people of Israel. I don't think that that anything has changed in terms of the vibrancy and the heroism of the Israeli people by and large uh, from even the generation of 48 and today. Um, But I do see a problem with the leadership, and I think that the problem is that it's who you listen to. You know, we, normal folk, we wake up in the morning, we talk to our families, we talk to our children, um, our friends, we have reality checks all the time when we have to go about the lives of normal people who have to raise their families. Um, and our leadership, somewhere along the way, stopped listening to us, started only listening to our media. And unfortunately, our media since 1976 has changed quite uh, substantially, particularly since 1977 when the Likud came into power, and they've really uh, become a voice for anti-Israel policies. And 
really almost, uh, you know, if you say two Jews, three opinions, you have 500 Israeli journalists, one opinion, and it's Shalom Akshav's opinion. And that's what they're trumpeting on the radio and television and in most of our daily newspapers, day in and day out. And that's what makes the headlines and that's what determines whether a prime minister or a foreign minister is looked at as somebody who is wise and worldly or stupid or corrupt or what have you. And so when they're worried about how they're gonna appear in the headlines the next day and whether they're going to be able to uh, carry out their policies, you know, they start becoming beholden not to their common sense and the kinds of things that motivate us to wake up every morning and, and go about our business, um, but rather by, you know, what, what uh, a very small, self-selected, self-appointed group of media commissars are going to say about them in the <coughs> newscast that evening or in the radio broadcast in the morning or in the headlines of the newspapers, and that has really made it very difficult for politicians to be brave. I mean, look at what you were mentioning, what Lieberman said the other day, and he's made a, several uh, very refreshing comments about, you know, this is ridiculous to think we're gonna make peace with these Palestinians in the years to come, look at them, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he gets derided by the media for making these points, and they interview disgruntled uh, ambassadors who say, how dare he tell me not to take the part of the Turkish government against Israel. You know, I mean, it, it's sort of, when you have this um, pro and con of being pro-Israel, you know, or this foreign minister of Israel, whether he should actually be advancing the national interests of Israel, and it's taken as a rational dis debate in the media, then you end up in a situation where politicians become beholden to sort of this asinine, crazy view of what is objective or what they should be striving <coughs> for as, as politicians and as leaders, and, and, and we see the results, you're right. Well, what doesn't make sense is, I mean, we left Lebanon, and then that soldiers were kidnapped, a war happened. We it didn't work out too good. We disengaged from Gaza, and then caused some rockets on steroid, and now Ashkelon, and now we're a settlement freeze, preparing for really the next expulsion. Why do we keep on making the same mistakes? I mean, the media has a relatively strong hold of, but I mean, come on. Why are our leaders making the same mistakes over and over again? Well, I think, you know, we have to look, especially in the last decade, right? Because you could say to a certain degree, although I didn't, but uh, in 93, when Rabin uh, followed Paris and Balin to Oslo, and embraced Yasser Arafat and established the Palestinian Authority, there was an argument to be made that said, well, why don't we try stupidity? We haven't tried it yet, right? You know, so... <laughs> it was the first time exactly, for everything. Exactly, right? And, and, you know, everybody makes a mistake. And, and you, could, you could sort of say, well, we, have, we haven't tried making peace and giving guns to a mass murderer of Jews yet. Perhaps it would work, you know? And, and, <laughs> And, 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 you know, and I'm saying it rather obnoxiously, but, but the fact is that there was room to suspend disbelief. There was hope, there was a thought, and there was this media drumbeat saying, yes, how can we not be recognizing the PLO that had been going on since 1987? So, you know, you, you had a situation, they went after it, right? That was, that was a mistake, but again, you, you could sort of, maybe not be completely out of your mind and think that it was a good idea. But then in 2000, that failed. It exploded literally in all of our faces. When we walked out of our houses, we were in danger of being uh, blown up. When we were in our homes, we were in danger of being butchered. Um, so it, you, you had a situation where it was absolutely clear that this had failed. And then Sharon came in after Barack and we all thought, well, you know, he won by 25 percentage points in the 2001 election, that he was going to change things, that he was going to, he was going to disabuse the world of the notion that it was a good idea to give guns to terrorists and give them your land and your rights and your legitimacy. Um, but instead of doing that, he uh, put Shimon Peres in as foreign minister and Fuad in as defense minister and um, refused to acknowledge that the PLO and the Palestinian Authority were the enemies of Israel. And, you know, you had massacre after massacre, notably the Dolphinarium massacre in June 2001, where President Bush stood on the lawn of the White House and essentially gave us the green light to go ahead and, and start fighting. And Sharon came out with this crazy statement saying that um, restraint was a form of strength. 
And, and then, you know, the September 11th attacks uh, came to the United States, and Paris went to the United Nations General Assembly, which was held later that year because it was supposed to be held the week of the attacks in November. And uh, he said that the solution is nanotechnology and Palestinian statehood. And, you know, this is not the voice that people in the United States even expected to be hearing from Zion, but it was the one that we were sounding. And then uh, in 2002, even, when we went in and, and had defensive shield and started taking it to the Palestinians, again, Sharon refused to acknowledge that it was the Palestinian Authority in Toto that was the problem and not just Yasser Arafat. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't really fight them to victory. We fought them. Uh, we, we destroyed a lot of terrorists, and we held the territory, which was extremely important, which is why we were able to breathe free again in places like Jerusalem. But uh, we didn't actually fight to win. And in fact, we fought in order to make it politically viable to repeat our appeasement of the 1990s. And then we saw that with the roadmap, and we saw that with Annapolis. And then, of course, we saw it with the military campaigns in, in, uh, in Cast Lead and in, and in Lebanon. And the most obvious thing that we saw, the most important uh, move that Israel made politically and strategically in, in the last decade was um, the expulsions from Gaza, which was not even appeasement. I mean, that was just saying, you know, whatever, right? What we're going to do is we're going to make war on ourselves. We're, you know, we, we don't want to declare you to be the enemy, so what an awesome plan, you know? Instead of saying that the Palestinians are the problem, they're raising their children to become suicide bombers from the age of zero. Um, Jews are the problem. Let's declare war on ourselves, right? And so, you know, that's what Sharon did. He declared war on religious Zionists, essentially, with the full backing of the leftist media, which has been waging a culture war against the religious Zionists since uh, the Likud rose to power in 77. And uh, this is what we got. We got Hamas in charge in Gaza. And we got Hamas so strong in Judea and Samaria that even if he wanted to, which of course he doesn't, uh, the head of the Palestinian Authority or the head of Fatah, whatever you want to call him, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, will never, ever even consider making peace with Israel because he'll be killed. So yeah, you, you have this crazy situation, and yet there's uh, Netanyahu suddenly today saying, yeah, it's a good idea to freeze Jewish building and Sure, it looks like the time is ripe for a new peace process. What is he talking about, right? It just, it's, no, it's not. And you're not stupid, so why do you say something that you clearly know is wrong? And the answer is, I think, because he fears the media more than he fears the public. Could it be that he fears war? I mean, what's the alternative? If we're not you know, going to have some sort of peace agreement with yeah, him... That's the point. I think that he's quite fearful that... Um, if, uh, you know, that, that over the past decade that we've squandered, that we've handed strategically vital land over to our enemies and actually made it strategically vital. I mean, Gaza was nothing. It was a nuisance. For 40 years or 38 years that we were in Gaza, it was a pain. It was a place where we had terrorism. It was a nest of terror and hatred, but it wasn't a strategic threat to Israel. When you hear about them having a very heavy ordnance, very heavy missiles and warheads that are capable of shooting uh, into Tel Aviv today, that, that means that Gaza, in the space of five years, has turned into a strategic threat. I mean, when they can reach the most uh, vital infrastructures in Israel and, and our civilian uh, uh, concentra population concentrations, then they become a strategic threat. And this is something they never wore for 38 years. Same thing in South Lebanon. Hezbollah reportedly can uh, reach, can not only can they reach Tel Aviv, but they can reach Tel Aviv with payloads of sufficient strength that can take down Israeli towers. So, you know, this is, this is not, and, and, you know, whether they can reach down to Beersheba and Dimona is also open to question. But the point is that we gave them land that had been maintaining peace in the Galilee, that had been maintaining peace in southern Israel. And from that land, they have uh, turned into threats to Tel Aviv <coughs> and Jerusalem. And, and this is something that we don't really recognize. And so when we think about what is a war going to look like tomorrow, you know, I mean, we, we conquered Judea and Samaria in 1967. I think it was with um, one, one uh, brigade. Today, you have one division um, 
it's not enough for all of Judea and Samaria. You know, you have to have, uh, we had three divisions fighting in, uh, in defensive shield in, uh, in Judea and Samaria. And, you know, we just don't have, it's not the same situation anymore. Same thing in Gaza. You know, we conquered Gaza in 67 with a battalion. And can you imagine? We had a battalion taking care of protecting Farda Rome. So, you know, you're talking about a completely different level of threat, and you're talking about a different type of warfare. You're talking about a different kind of threat to Israel. And so, yes, if I were prime minister, I certainly would be fearful of war. Unfortunately, what we see with our avoidance of conflict, with our attempt to appease our enemies, what we've done is made the prospect of war all the more frightening. And so, in the end, we're not deterring ourselves. We're emboldening our enemies and our worst enemies. I mean, you have uh, South Lebanon and, and Gaza today are controlled by Iran. They're not controlled by some local uh, sheikhs that you can pay off or whatever or expel. I mean, they're, they're controlled by the Revolutionary Guards of, of, of the Iranian regime. And so you, you, have, you have a completely different kettle of fish here that we, have to, that we have to deal with. And unfortunately, it's clear to me uh, that we are going to pay a very big price because we have been at war for the past 10 years and we've been ignoring it at our peril. And um, I certainly um, am not advocating war, I'm advocating reconciling with reality. I mean, there are a lot of different ways that you can, you can deal with a security problem. But I don't think that the way to do it is to uh, bury your head in the sand or blame yourself and make war on your own people. I mean, that is not, how you, how you protect your country, that's how you eviscerate your country still further. And so, you know, the first thing that I could say is, uh, you know, when you dug yourself into a hole, the first thing that you should do is quit digging. And unfortunately, we keep digging further and further into that hole. Okay, so we're running out of time, but there's a couple of questions we, I really I'm very long-winded, I'm sorry. We can always uh, edit it on TV and you could watch the rest of the interview on thelandofisrael.com. Uh, here is, you know, you said eviscerating an entire country. How does it happen where we elect a right-wing leader? I remember when Sharon came into office, I felt this sense of security, like something like Gaza would never happen. This whole platform against Mitzna was that Gaza was like Tel Aviv. I felt this and he security. Was right. <laughs> oh, I guess that's true. So I, I felt this, this sense of security. And now, Ranan Gisin just said today, he was, he was Sharon's spokesman, he said that Bibi is going down the same exact route that Sharon did. How is it that we vote in right-wing leaders, because it seems like the country is their feet on the ground, they're voting in a right-wing leader, and we get these left-wing leaders all the time, and how do we tolerate it? Okay, so I want to make two points here. One is because, for some reason, I have this sneaking suspicion that most of the people here are not merits voters. So, uh, if, if, uh, if, if I'm correct in my assumption, I think that it's important for uh, Israelis on the right wing to understand something. That one of the things that I'm sure Netanyahu thinks about is what happened to him last time he was prime minister. And, I mean, I say this not because I've talked to him about what he thinks about, but because this is what I would think about if I were him. And what most people do, they think about, we think about our past. We think about what happened to us, and, and we learn our lessons based upon what's happened to us in the past. And the fact is that in 1999, this <coughs> government fell because he was betrayed by the right. And when he came to form his government uh, last year, um, the first thing that the right said was, we will bring you down if you don't do what we tell you to do. And so lo and behold, he didn't put them in the government. And you know, when you're dealing with uh, weak hand, which is what uh, the right-wing parties came out with in the past elections. Um, you have to play your cards very carefully. You don't leave with your chin. And unfortunately, um, the politicians in the right-wing parties don't seem to have learned that lessons. And that's one thing that we should bear in mind because you have to influence where you can influence and that's one thing that has to be borne into consideration. And on the other hand, I think that the important thing moving ahead is we have to concentrate on the kind of solutions that we can make to the problems on our level as private citizens. And I started an initiative, which I'd like to just share, because I think, not because what I'm doing is great, although I'm really proud of it, but because I think that it's something that, that people should think about doing themselves, which is that I started, I raised money to start a website in Hebrew called Latma, latma.co.il, which is a, uh, thanks 
which is a uh, Hebrew language website that is a satire website that uh, does satire on the Israeli media. Because I believe that if we want to have a discourse in Israel that's relevant to the challenges that we face, if we want to be able to have a discussion that doesn't lead us back to Oslo time after time after time, then we have to discredit the people who are pushing us into that uh, a dialogue of the deaf and dumb. We have to be able to say, look, our media elites are stupid and incompetent and they don't know what they're talking about. And let's replace them. Let's replace them. And that really is a revolution, because when you think what a revolution is, a revolution is replacing one elite with another. And, what, and that is what has to be done. We have to open up our media to all the voices in Israel, because the truth is, people are going to stop listening to insanity when they have a chance to listen to sanity. And so it's not that I want to silence anybody. I want to empower people to speak. And I think that the more that we, as the people of Israel can have our voices heard, and the internet is a wonderful place to do it, the more we will be heard, and the more we're gonna to listen to ourselves and not listen to people who tell us that the only way forward is to go backward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. I feel smarter. She has a way of making our state look so insane. You know, it's funny, last season, Jeremy and I filmed a, a Meet the Streets for a show that turned out to be really my favorite show of all time. What we did was we went to a Peace Now rally in Tel Aviv. And our goal was to get them to say something positive and, and you know, nice and optimistic about the Jews of Hebron. And we were sure we'd be able to get them to say something. And the nicest thing we could hear, get them to say was a bullet for every fascist, or maybe they have good English. Or they, we couldn't get them really to say anything that was good. And we left saying, well, I'm sure we could have gotten the Jews of Hebron to say something nice about the Jews of peace now. So we did that. And really, the rest is history. You can see the show on the website. But something that struck me, that stayed with me ever since, wasn't that question. It's another question that we asked them. We said, we asked them the one question that really you would think unifies the entire Jewish world, which is, do you think we need to have more Jewish unity? So we thought they were gonna say yes, but every single one of them said no. We do not need more unity, we do not need more unity. And the more I was thinking about it, why? Why, what was, it was so revealing, because under the surface it is that exact question which reveals what is the pathology really in their world view. That because Jewish unity is saying there's us and there's them. That there's a Jewish people and we could be united and we have our own thing, and there's them, and they don't wanna be different. They don't want to be separate. It's that very Jewish soul inside of them that's tormenting them that leads them to actually declare war on us, on themselves. Now, the truth is we all have our baggage that we're contending with. But I think with, with them in peace now, it's, it's very extreme. But it highlights, I think, a lesson that we need to take. Because when I look at our leaders and I say, why do they keep repeating the same mistakes again and again? Land for peace, land for peace, land for peace. And I think the answer really is because the alternative for them is too scary. Because if they actually ask themselves certain questions, these questions may shake their fundamental worldview. It may cause them to question beliefs that they've held on dearly for their entire lives. If the Arabs don't hate us because of politics or, or land, and there's no way we can placate them. Why do they hate us so much? And the Western world, with, with all of our you know, uh, contributions, with our uh, human rights, with our compromises that are historical and unparalleled and suicidal, they seem to hate us too. Is there something that transcends normalcy, the rational world? Is there something about the fact that we're Jews, that we're different? Is that the reason they hate us? Now, I think our message here tonight to our leaders and to the entire world is yes, we're different. And thank God we're different. We thank God every single day that we're different. We have a special role. We have a task. Hashem gave us the Torah and the mitzvot. We're supposed to give a recognition of God to the entire world, be vessels and conduits to the entire world. We've given the world enough diplomatic jargon. How about we start and give them a little bit of light? Shalom from Jerusalem. Oh, 
No. Oh.